All right, it is double header day on the Speed Skating Video Podcast. Let's go. All right, so my second guest today is uh, another one of these guys that came from a different sport. So he was a hockey player, a pretty darn good one. Um, but injuries forced him out of that sport and he decided to take a chance on speed skating and he is just coming off his first Olympic appearance. So let's bring in Mr. Austin Kleba. It's going. <laughs> All the way from Salt Lake City, Utah, right? Yep, yep, that is okay, where I am so currently. When, when are you going to Calgary? Uh, we leave on Wednesday, so just oh. a couple of days. Gotcha, okay. Cool. So speaking of hockey and speaking of your time as a hockey player, um, tell me about Austin Kleba, the hockey player. <laughs> like what I was like back then? Yeah, what, what, kind of, what kind of player were you? Were you a forward? Uh, yeah, I was a center. Okay, so, so what, I, were, what I was... were you good at? I was good at speed, believe it or not. That was my strong suit. <laughs> I actually was pretty bad at stick handling. I was okay at shooting, um, but I think a couple years I was like the point leader and stuff like that. Just for I would pass it a lot. I think I was like the assist person of the year, whatever that's called. But um, yeah, no, I, I I I was good at speed. I was good at going fast. Could you win a face off? Uh, it depends on against who. I mean, <laughs> depends on who I'm facing. I, c I could theoretically win one, but... Yeah, so clearly speed was your biggest asset, but you had a, a number of injuries. Was it was it all the same body part, or did you just have multiple injuries? Um, I had a few, like, smaller injuries, and, in, like, one was consistent. So my shoulder... The dislocation of my shoulder was like a very consistent one that I had. Um, within six months, one year, I broke my thumb, uh, broke my collarbone, which seems like it'd be more major, but that actually wasn't too bad. And then I also dislocated my shoulder, which I didn't think was that bad at the time, but actually was the worst like reoccurring thing. Still have to deal with it today. Um, really? Like terrible injury to get, but. Huh. Yeah, I had that. I had some groin stuff too that was an issue, but nothing crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, how old were you when you decided that hockey was just not going to happen anymore? Um, I was, I think, fifteen or just turned fifteen. I was at like a hockey camp, and I dislocated my shoulder again uh, while I was there. And like just previously that week, I got like the blue line to blue line record or something for my age group at this camp and so i was like pretty pumped on the fact that i was like going pretty fast <laughs> and so i decided on the way back home from this like camp i decided to you know, ask my parents about speed skating or like i think i saw it in the olympics the previous year and so my parents actually called um we were like in minnesota my parents called carl seprin for the entirety, I think it was actually the entire trip home, the entire seven hours, I think we were talking to Carl about getting into it. Like Carl was just very adamant about getting me on the ice and trying to get me to do it and everything. So that was really cool that he really seemed to care and it was it was fun. Well, I, th I think those of us that know Carl understand that that's not surprising. If you yeah. give Carl the mic for seven hours, he will he will fill it. Oh, yeah, he's got a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, he's a good man. So, you know, it seems like every person I've ever met that comes from northern Illinois is always a short tracker slash long tracker. So with, with the whole Glen Allen thing, did you do any short track, a lot of short track? Um, I did a little bit of short track in the beginning. Um, since I was in Illinois and... Milwaukee, the rink, like about was two hours from my house. Mm. So a lot of my cross train ended up being short track. Okay. And so, yeah, I did a lot of short track in terms of training, but I competed just a couple times for fun. Uh, yeah, I have never really took it that seriously other than training. But a lot of people do do short track, and there was a lot of good short trackers around me growing up, I guess. Okay. So when, when you... 
when you started um, up with with the ASC group up in in Milwaukee, um, how did you feel you were received? Uh, I mean, did did you fit right in? Did you make friends with those guys right away? Um, yeah, I would say that fitting in in speed skating, I feel like everyone's so different anyway. So it's just kind of like understanding everybody. And like when I first joined, it was Ethan. Like Ethan was one of the people that I first joined with, uh, Hannah Bosman, Evan Flaherty, um, Michael Koenig, like Brand Melinda, those people. And so they were, none of them are like, you know, in, intimidating or like rude people, you know, they're all pretty nice. So it was pretty easy to just like fit in and get along with everyone and have fun. It was a good, good group to start with. Yeah, that's, I, th I think about the time I decided to take up this sport, I don't think you had been there too long. Um, no, I might have been there like two years or maybe a year when you yeah. joined. Yeah, when I gave yeah. my life away to this sport. <laughs> it takes it. it. takes it right. But it's interesting because, you know, you and I both came from hockey and, you know, we came from a team environment and speed skating – you know, strictly speaking, is is an individual sport. Um, but to me, I mean, I'm on a team now, and you've always been on a team. Um, I mean, is has that been helpful for you? Is is that something that that you like about what you're doing now? Yeah, I would say being on a team adds a good social dynamic. You know, there's like a lot that you can learn from people, e even like in skating and outside of skating you know we're all people it's nice to just be surrounded by people who also care i feel like being on a team you see you know what someone has to put in and all the work that they have to do so it's easy to like really appreciate when others do well on the team and like have that dynamic is really nice um it's definitely a lot different than hockey i would say the whole team dynamic because it still is an individual sport right but i think in training and stuff like that it's a lot of fun like we have a good amount of fun everyone's stressed out when we go and go race and you know everyone's in their own own zone but sure. in training it's a lot of fun how many junior worlds did you go to i went to four really yeah i, I went I to all the four. Jeez, you so four junior worlds a uh, youth olympic games so you could just write a book on your youth career I have I have some yeah a lot of stuff that I did in the I was very fortunate to go to like a lot of those things and do all that as a junior mostly the youth olympics the youth olympics was really cool yeah really what's sweet <laughs> let's talk about that a little bit because uh, that was only when Mahala was on I think we decided that that was only the second one that they had ever done so mm -hmm. was there an olympic village and ceremonies and a bunch of other sports and tons of people from all over the world yeah no it was it's pretty much like not just like the olympics but when i was there we didn't live in like a village village they didn't like make it for us or anything i'm not sure if they made the one in actual lily hammer uh, for the people but we were in hamar because it was like an we were like a couple hours i think away from lily hammer yeah um okay but that's where the rink was but um we just stayed in like a hotel and stuff but it was it was still like very olympic themed you had to go through like scanners and stuff to get in kind of like you know how the olympics were um so it was it was very olympic-esque it was you know organized by the same people and everything but it, it was really it was fun because it was also not as serious uh, it was a lot more relaxed and everyone's just a kid there it's not like super serious to say you have a youth olympic medal or anything but so it was just, it was aside from that epic um, four-person mixed team sprint that you participated in, I assume you did a 500,000. Did you do anything else? Um, it was just the 515. 515 oh, really? mass start in the team sprint. Yeah, they don't do all the events. Okay. Yeah. So how was your 15? It was actually, I'm pretty sure it was better than my 500 in terms of placement. <laughs> I got sixth in the 500. I got fifth in the 15. Really? Was, That's why they made yeah, you an anchor was, in the team sprint, right? Yeah, I, my aerobic base was pretty solid that year. I feel like I, so to make the team, I had to do the 15 for the actual like 
event in the year prior i think my pb was like a 203 okay. so i had to make it based on the sam log and i was freaking out the last year because i was like there's no way i'm going to make this team if i just have like an okay 500 so, so i just ran a bunch <laughs> so what uh so what what was your 1500 that you skated that qualified you for the event then what did you go i went 152.9 i think in milwaukee when i was oh. like a c1 or not a c1 a b1 i'm sorry yeah that's yeah. pretty sporty yeah so i guess at the time that was freaking out <laughs> the secret to do a great 1500 i guess you just have to run a lot I think you gotta, you gotta have no fear. I think is this the secret in the fifteen? I think if you go into it and you're like, I know I'm gonna die. Like this is this is it. Yeah. Um, then you can really pull one out. But if you go any type of afraid into the fifteen, it's not gonna go as well as you wanted to. Yeah. Understood. So you spent a lot of time in the Pettit. Um, you know, we we talked about this a little bit with Ethan. Um, I, I think there's gotta be some some specific memories there for you certainly you know qualifying for 2022 games has got to be up there um do you have any other i guess specific memories of the paddock oh specific memories i mean and i think anna was bringing this up the other day anna quinn that we uh we <laughs> like there was just a day where i think uh, eric wasn't there yet or something and like we were there early and we just decided to set up a bunch of hurdles and do like races down down the 100 for no reason <laughs> just like st stuff like that i remember i remember flipping water bottles onto the sides of the building um on like electric boxes yeah. Yeah. i mean skating wise i remember that 15 very well that i did for that trials i just remember how much i really wanted to do it i remember the 2018 olympic trials really well like that was a good memory having the crowd there was a really good memory that i had yeah, skating. Yeah. That was that, really cool. The 18 qualifiers was so cool. So I have a few specific memories of you. Um, well, there's there's one that this kind of goes to the whole, um, a whole nother narrative about, uh, you know, being tense before races and stuff. But I remember one day it was a, a time trial and you had to skate a thousand. And I think you were like pair seven and it was like pair two and you hadn't even put your skates on yet. And I'm just looking at you like, I'm like, dude, are you doing a thousand? You're like, yeah. I'm like, are you? Yeah, I'm up pretty soon. And you're, you did, you're like, you stood there, you did two like squat jumps and you kind of went like this and you're like, all right, I'm ready. And you threw your skates on and you just went out and just crushed one. And I'm like, man, I, I want to be like that kid. Like that was just, it's so loose, <laughs> just, you know, not a care in the world. So that I remember. I remember the um, costume race with the bobsled that you guys built um, that fell apart at about 70 meters. But that was yep. not your design, though. No, but it's not my design. That's that's all Will's fault for making the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it definitely got no wind tunnel testing, but it was still entertaining. Yeah, that's that that's fun. what I think of when I think back of those ASC days with that team, with you guys. It was uh, it was pure entertainment. I'm I'm glad I got to see <laughs> some of that back in the day. Yeah, it was it was fun to be a part of. It was it was a good time. But you know, then you you graduated and you moved off to Salt Lake uh, to the national team. And when I, you know, I think about all the time that I saw you when you were in Milwaukee, and then it's like you went off to college or you went off to the military and then like the next time I saw you, you know, it was, there was an immediate impact on me when I looked at your skating. I mean, it just, so many things about it just looked different and of course better. Do you, do you feel like a lot changed? Um, yes, I do feel like a lot changed. I feel like my perception of what skating is and like how it should be performed um, changed a lot, I guess, how I thought skating should be done. I learned a lot from, of course, Ryan, um, and also Joey helped me a lot. Uh, yeah, he was really? kind of a mentor for me when I was out there. What exactly did you learn that, that really changed your perception? Um, 
I guess before I didn't think of skating as a, I guess the best way to put it is like a full motion. You just try to kind of go as fast as you can, you know, have your hips forward, kind of like, I never really thought of it too much as a finesse, more of like a test of power, I would say. And then going to the national team, I guess I learned a lot more about, it's like a, like a consistent pressure, I guess, like getting into like very specific parts of it but having kind of like a consistent pressure, like a way that I describe it, and I'm not sure if this is the best way to describe it, but when you're skating, it should kind of feel like the same pressure that when you're biking or something like that, you always have like a consistent, you're never, you know, jerking the chain and like going back and forth versus in, in skating, like that's how I feel like it should also feel. It's kind of like a consistent pressure and how you get that is very, you know, can be kind of hard versus if you're, off your pressure one second, you kind of let your hips go or something. It's kind of like jerking that chain if yeah. you're comparing it to biking. So mm. I feel like learning kind of how to connect it together and how to make everything smooth um, was a big change. I would say is that that's one of the bigger things and learn how to lean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that also. Yeah, I remember. Um when you you had come back to Milwaukee for a race or something and and I got a couple minutes with you and I was kind of asking you some of that stuff and and you just said oh um yeah I learned to trust my lean <laughs> that is that is one thing that you need to do you need to trust it's kind of like falling you know you're you're kind of constantly falling in in the corner you're almost just controlling that fall yeah it's like you're just making it so it's smooth. It's almost like free energy. Of course, it's not free. You know, you're working for it, but yeah. um, kind of puts that pressure down without having to really go go too ham into it. Well, let's take a look at a little bit of you doing just that here. All right. It's a little shaky, but I mean, what what <laughs> I see is just I see somebody who's a lot um, a lot freer. I would say, you know, when, mm -hmm. when I look at that, especially in that straightaway, it looks more, it, it just looks more relaxed. It doesn't look rushed. You know, you are mm -hmm. clearly waiting for the load every single time. Um, you know, it just, it looks so much different, uh, probably a little bit lower. Um, but then that corner, of course, like you said, I, I'm, you know, there's a lot of still, photos out there on the internet of Austin Kleba in the corner and you know I, I just think your your body position spot on I mean you're you're as low you look as low as I think you can get um which is which is a compliment because you know everybody thinks they're low and then they see a picture and they're like oh not even close <laughs> but how how long did it take you to feel like you really belonged out there when you made the move mm maybe uh probably like maybe a whole year like it's just hard transitioning to a team that uh everyone was just so much older than me when i was out there i was oh. like the rookie by far when i joined it wasn't like it was too intimidating or anything but going from a team of people that are you know ethan uh michael hannah bosman evan flaherty you know people that are you know like not like not like they're mean and so like or anything, but younger people that are my age than going to like Brittany, Joey, Kamani, Steve, uh, Hartman. Um, Brett, I mean, Brett wasn't like too serious all the time, but like having older people on the team that were very serious was definitely a big change. And it was, I think it was good to see that seriousness because uh, coming from like where it's, we were very like, just having fun with it and stuff like that and seeing people who took it very seriously. Like, this is what, you know, they're doing for a living. You know, this is, this is yeah. it. You had and to learn how to be that, professional. Yes. No, it was very good to see that. And I think trying to figure out how I should be in skating, how I should take it. That was a good step for me to see that. It took, it took a while for me to get used to it though. It was a lot different of an atmosphere, but it's not a bad one by any means. <laughs> Do you remember your first senior world cup? Um, I do. It was in Salt Lake. Yeah, 2017. Um, you set a, a junior national record at the time. I did, yes. <laughs> you remember that. 
Yeah, the, it's funny that race. The the day before, I think I went like a thirty six four. I think I went a whole second slower the day before in the five hundred. <laughs> Like, I think I was just freaking out so hard about it being my first race that I was like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. Like, I can't can't mess this up. Like, people are going to see this. Um, yeah, it's silly. People are going to see this. Yeah, that's my problem sometimes. So I was I was looking at some of your times and, and just, you know, trying to analyze uh, some of the, the path between 18 and 22. And I was looking at 19, and you did World Cups there, and then I was looking at 21. And, I mean, like, there's a significant difference. The times you were hovering at in 19, like, 36, whatever, and then in mm-hmm. 21, it's, like, low fives and high fours. So what the hell changed in two years? What did you do, Austin? <laughs> oh, it took a lot of technical technical work like that i would say that was the big thing going out to salt lake is having and seeing people that were going faster people that were doing the times that i wanted to do and learning it like kind of what i was saying before the finesse of skating um it's it, it, skating's not something that you can just show up to i would say every single day and not think about or not have clear intention to what you're doing you got to really hone down on every aspect of technique and like everything that you can possibly get per push and i think just when i was in when i was back in milwaukee i just didn't have as much of the mentality of it being like an art or being like something that you're truly mastering like you're mastering these four strokes And at some point, it doesn't matter how strong you are. Like, the strength might hit a limit, but how you can skate um, is something that can always, I feel like, be evolved or keep keep pushing. So when I was out, yeah, in Salt Lake, um, Joey just a lot, he did actually a lot of um, video work with me. Yeah, I don't feel like I really even knew how to lean before I came out to Salt Lake or understand what, like, the concept of counterbalancing yourself with like the fall of everything and how your hips are supposed to be placed and how they're supposed to be forward. Like, I feel like I knew what I had to do before, but I didn't understand why I had to do it. I think going out to Salt Lake and talking with people who were already doing it made me understand what what it was I was trying to achieve with everything, like setting down with pressure and like why I'm trying to get weight transfer and honing down on it. Really like coming every day with clear intention is important I think Mm. very important. So with all of this, um, you know, learning and being exposed to all this new technique, uh, I assume there were moments of frustration. Did you ever feel like you just weren't going to get it? Yeah, Um, there's definitely points. And I think going from the technique that you once knew to trying to learn something new, it also takes and with the hardest thing I think it is for most people, including myself is forgetting the things that you knew or forgetting the bad habits and not doing them anymore. Um, So yeah, my entire first year, I would say out here, I was like slowly learning, but I'd say the second year is when I really tried hard to put my technique down and do everything right. And I saw improvement that year, but not as much as I thought I should with how much, you know, I just put into it. But it was really the next year after that where those that those fruits of labor, I would say, paid off. And that taught me a very valuable lesson about patience, mostly in the sport, is that it does, it takes time for those things to become natural and for those things to really like coincide, like your body and your brain and everything to make those connections and for your muscles to just get used to doing stuff takes rest, takes recovery. You know, it's very much a hard position to be in, as you know, you know, it's not an an easy thing to just do. so yeah, I think time is a time is a big one and really being persistent. I think it's all like the cliche things people say just became so true when I was doing uh, skating, you know, like be persistent, you know, come with intention, you know, think about what you're doing. And when you really, I think when you really hone down on just the basic things like that, I think it's very possible to get better and to like forget the things and to learn new things. Yeah, very happy that I uh, had good people around me that cared and wanted me to like succeed and helped me and taught me a lot. Joey, Ryan, of course. That's really interesting. It's fortunate that, that you could walk into a situation like that and have people to guide you because clearly, um, you know, you had to unlearn a lot of stuff and it took literally took years, you know, and yeah. you, you achieve some, uh, some success that reflects that. 
Well, let's talk about the run-up to trials last January. Um, that fall, you know, there's some really competitive situation with sprinting in the U.S. and all of a sudden Jordan just lost his mind and started going a million miles an hour. Um, you know, clearly that, that kind of made a, a story for trials, but it was still going to be super tight. You know, you performed well. You know, I think initially you probably felt like you had a spot in the 500, the 1,000 wasn't really clear, but you still, if I understand it correctly, you still have to pretty much wait for confirmation as to what the team is. Is that correct? Yeah, like I had to wait after I won or got second in the 500. I had to wait like, it was like three weeks. It was literally like three days before we flew to LAX um, to like do all the team processing and stuff like that. I knew like three, two, three days before we left for that, that I actually made the team. So I was just sitting there like, I, I really hope that this goes through. Like just sitting there like, oh, I, I did what I could. Now I just have to sit here and wait. It was a weird period, weird period of time. So when you got the call, you knew you were on the team, but at that moment, was it 500 and 1,000 or was it just 500? Just the 500, yeah. Okay. I got the 1,000 because Joey pulled out of it like the day before. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So he would have raced the 1,000, but he wanted to focus on the mass start. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. so then all of a sudden it's like, oh, bonus. Let's let's go see. Yeah, yeah, might as well. Yeah, I knew like literally the day before, and I was I was prepared, of course. Like I I knew that I had like the sub spot, but I was like, oh man, I didn't think that I was actually gonna get like put in. <laughs> like oh, <laughs> geez, good thing I was actually training this week. Well, speaking of that 500, you were first pair, and yep. in, in in classic Kleba fashion, you put on a great show, but. Let's first, let's take a look at the opener, and I want you to tell me what you see, but I'm, uh, there's one thing in this opener that I see that, that is very distinctive, but let's watch it together first real quick. Ready? Mm So I thought that opener looked solid. Uh, what did you see? Um, I thought the turnover was pretty good. I thought that I had a good weight transfer. It's a little hard to tell from the angle because it's like coming down. Um, we usually look at everything like head on, but I would say that the weight transfer was pretty good. I think that I could have been a little bit more patient in my pushes, but what are you, what are you looking for specifically? What were you thinking? I mean, you know, you got to remember like a lot of, a lot of Austin Kleba footage that I've seen was live. <laughs> You know, and it was several years ago um, before you've made mm -hmm. all these changes. So when, when I look at it, I mean, to me, it looks really patient. You know, you're still a hockey player. So the first six steps are going to be what they are. Like, I don't think that's mm -hmm. going to change tremendously. But to me, it's like I see second gear and third gear and fourth gear. And I see where it just becomes very powerful skating. You know, you're still low. There's awesome weight transfer. I mean, I don't know if the time was exactly what you would expect. But, you know, it's still, to me, it was it was solid. But let's take a look at the, the back end of this thing here. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> love it. Love that ending always. Entertaining Kleba. He's always going to do something fun for us. So. Before we talk about the big celebration, um, you know, as far as the, that back corner, I mean, anytime you come out that wide, um, it's probably because you're going really fast. But I, I think, you know, the, the corner was great. And then the, the final 50, I always look at, to me, there's certain skaters that can really continue to produce some acceleration and some power in that final 50. And some people look like they're just trying to get to the end. But you looked like you yeah. were still, you know, turning it over. And, you know, there was a lot yeah, of free well, upper body. It. And, yeah, it looked it looked good until you decided to do whatever that was. And... <laughs> See, everyone thinks that that was a celebration. That was, I, I was, I hawked at the line. And then... Okay. I threw my hands up because I was like trying to get my balance and then that's when I fell. So people thought I was like celebrating. I wasn't even <laughs> celebrating. I was just like trying to remain stable and I didn't do it. So <laughs> ended up in the pads. What's funny is, you know, there there weren't a lot of people in the building, but if you watched it closely, 
I just noticed this today. Um, you can kind of hear the crowd go, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. As he goes crashing. <laughs> Oh, no, I would say a lot of people ask me, like, oh, did you finish the race, though? I was like, yeah, like, it was right after the race. Like, I feel like when people hear that I fell, they're like, oh, I fell in the race. Yeah. Like, no, I don't feel like most people fall after the race. <laughs> it's kind of a silly thing to happen. But... What, what do you pull away from that event? What, what, what changed you? Um, that's a really good question. I would say seeing the other athletes seeing kind of um the mentality of other people there um that was a big takeaway the seriousness of it like i would say that not that i don't feel pressure anymore but being at the highest level of something and seeing how much pressure that can be or you know how stressful that is kind of puts everything else into a different perspective or a different light that doesn't make it easy or anything like that, but it makes it easier, I'd say, to focus on what's important and actually trying and going fast and skating well instead of being nervous about, you know, oh, this is like the last, the make it or break it race of something. Um, so I would say that that was a big takeaway. Like, I would say it was a pretty confidence building experience to go do and, you know, see all these people and be a part of something pretty big. Yeah. Be a part of something kind of special was very cool to do. Um, so, yeah. be, well, because of the fact that it was just such a weird one and everything was so sterile, um, mm -hmm. does that does that give you extra motivation to want to be in Italy in 26? <laughs> it does. It actually does. I thought about that a few times. I was like, man, like I kind of want to go to like a Olympics where I can go out in the village and were you able to see other sports besides long track? Uh, yes, I, we were allowed to. I ended up only seeing, I saw maybe two short track races, I think. Um, and then I ended up watching, I think I saw every single U.S. skater uh, skate their race. I went for every long track thing because it's like our team, you know, it's people I know. Got to support sure. them, got to go watch. Yeah. And yeah, it was, it was really cool, really cool to see. Is it too obvious of a question to ask like what was the highlight um i would say it's like an obvious question i think everyone has a little bit different of answers mine would for sure be seeing aaron win i think people would be like oh isn't it your race but i mean the race was really cool don't get me wrong but seeing like someone that you know absolutely like do the top thing that there is in sport was really really special i would say to watch like how much people were freaking out like jen our nutritionist was l losing her mind next to me like you know crying you know just <laughs> absolutely just blown away and taken back by it and just seeing that was really really crazy i would yeah. say one of the probably, almost maybe a once in a lifetime thing to see like your teammate win a gold medal at the olympics is pretty pretty insane yeah i mean that was my assumption because you did say that you you were seeing all the long track and you watched all your all your teammates skate so i figured maybe that was probably a big highlight the did you do the opening and closing ceremonies uh yes i did both yep. okay was that super weird the closing was a little bit weird the opening it wasn't weird like i, don't, I wouldn't say like covid affected the opening ceremonies that was actually pretty pretty magical i feel like when i describe the olympics it's kind of like disneyland for like old athletes or like you know people that are older it's almost like you know you're walking in and there's these rings and there's you know people all around it's like a very like sur surreal experience yeah um it was pretty pretty cool the opening was really really special so you said that you found out you were going to do the thousand like 24 hours before you did it. Um, how would you rate your race? Oh man, I would say the entire time that I was in Beijing, um, I felt like I couldn't really put down the ice. Like my pressure was a little high. I wouldn't rate that race very well. I would say that was maybe like a six or seven out of ten. <laughs> oh man, that was that wasn't the best showcase I would say for my thousand, but. It happens. It's all right. Yeah. All right. So we kind of talked about this before, but I want I want to ask you this anyway, and it kind of goes back to that story I told about you 
um, doing the thousand at the time trial where you're just like, hey, yeah, I'm ready to go. So, I mean, I've, I've known you for a number of years. You've always had this, you know, this very boisterous, funny demeanor about you. But um, do you struggle with, with any anxiety when it comes to race day? Or are you, are you pretty chill or are you just the same as the rest of us? Oh, I would say that I, I definitely get anxious. Um, I would say just like how I, how it affects me is more like, <laughs> it's almost like this little like urge. I wouldn't say it's necessarily even anxiety, but it just kind of feels like I'm on edge. Like, you know, I'm like ready to pounce. It's that feeling of being kind of like not mad or angry, but just like excited and like ready. And I would say casual living is a lot different than a race weekend or something and how I'm feeling or how I'm like approaching it. So yeah, I would say I definitely get an anxiety to a level. I think, you know, going before the line and waking up in the morning being like, I gotta, I gotta put one down today. It's gotta be important, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> kind of thing. But I think getting into the mentality where you're racing is very similar to your practices that you can go into it with the same mentality the same like i'm focusing as hard as i can i'm working on the same things even racing's practice to one degree yeah and we do a lot of race practice people talk about um uh public speaking is is something that causes people just tremendous anxiety and you know i i've struggled with that in the past and and i don't really remember where i learned it exactly but at some point it's like your performance is going to be directly proportional to your preparation. If you are prepared mm -hmm. and you know the material, people can ask you questions and you're just going to you're just going to crush it. And to me that's everything that this sport is. You know, if you are prepared, yeah, you're still going to be anxious, but you know, you're probably going to do pretty well or you're going to do as well as you should if you're prepared. If you aren't prepared and races are completely opposite of what you're doing, yeah, you're going to really, and for good reason, you're going to be very anxious yeah. because it's like, oh, I, I never wear my hood. Now all of a sudden I have a hood on and what's happening? I don't know how to go to the line. And so, yeah. Yeah, I think that, I mean, in both, I think that you have to trust yourself. But I think when it comes down to racing, um, that's when, like, you know, you get anxiety and then you start having doubts about, oh, what if I, like, you know, do this or what if I do this or you know, if I don't hit this right, or if I'm not like going fast enough. And all those doubts are kind of um, like, they just are like almost just something that comes with anxiety. I feel like for most people, or at least for me, uh, having those doubts, but being able to like treat it like training and trust it just like training. Like, you know, you're not gonna just come out in one race and start skating completely different and be like a thousand times better or just go two seconds faster than you know, the weekend before or something like that, you know, you got to, it's a slow grind to be able to keep that form and keep that technique and keep it all going forward. So just trusting what you have been doing and stuff like that, I think is a really important thing yeah. to keep in mind when racing. I think yeah. that's well stated. Um, Jeffrey Swider Peltz once said, I was complaining about something, which I often do and and he just looked at me and he goes you're never as good or as terrible as you think you are just remember that I'm like yeah that's that's, 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 that's a, very true it's a really good, a good perspective quote. yeah <laughs> all right so let's shift gears into something completely different so i think for quite a while you have been into the music creation thing um with your with your electronic vibes and uh beats that you're you're crafting so when did you start doing that? Um, I started making or producing music like on my computer and everything when I was 14 or yeah, I think it was when I turned 14. I asked for like a software for my birthday and uh, I started just making stuff. All my friends did it. That was like a big thing that my entire friend group even to this day like makes music and stuff like that. So it was kind of like a fun thing that we did together. Okay, kids. so I assume it's it's primarily some genre of electric music, and it, you're just Probably. creating beats and samples and stuff, right? Yeah, I'd say it's. I don't really focus on any kind of particular genre or anything. I kind of just go into it and make whatever whatever feels right. <laughs> what <laughs> software are you using these days? 
I use Logic, Logic Pro. Okay. And uh, no vocals, correct? Uh, not yet. I'm, I've been thinking about starting starting to try to sing or do something. Yeah. All right, this is exciting. Uh, <laughs> you heard it here first on the, the SVP. <laughs> Cleavis going to yep. start singing. <laughs> I might. We'll see. Okay. I, I, I do practice sometimes. I mean, I play stuff on my guitar and sing sometimes along to it, but... Yeah, just just I just have fun with it. I feel like I do it as like a hobby, and hopefully at some point it might make me some money or something. But just do, do it for fun. Do you yeah. play piano as well? Um, like sort of. I I learned piano pretty much off of using synthesizers, um, and like my computer because I have like MIDI plugins for keyboards and stuff like that. So sure. never learned on like an actual piano or from like a piano teacher. But I know, like, I know my scales. I know, like, how to play chords and stuff like that. I know, you know, inversions. I, I took a music theory class, so I know a good amount of all the stuff. I'm not the best player ever. I would, I'm not as good as Joey, I would say, yeah. at actually playing the piano. Are you a good guitar player? I, yeah, I would say I'm pretty good at guitar. I'm pretty okay. decent at guitar. I've been playing it since I was 12 or 13. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty good at guitar. Definitely a lot better than the piano. So what what's the last song you played on guitar? Oh, the last song. I feel like I just take like little little loops from different songs that I like and I play them all the time. Like I played uh, "Ceilings" by the Local Natives. Like I just played like a little little piece of that earlier today. I was playing a song called "Jet Fuel" by Mac Miller. I was playing like the just the riff of that I knew. So do you ever record any of your guitar stuff and, and pull it into any of the stuff you're creating? I do. All right. I do do that sometimes, yeah. I do record. I don't, the thing is, I don't post a lot of the music that I make, which is kind of like, I should probably post it a little bit more, but I make a lot of stuff that someone would sing on or someone would do something on like that. Um, so I don't just like post them that often. But yeah, I have like a good amount of stuff where I just, pick up the guitar and play some riff or do some chords or something into it. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll have to collab on something. <laughs> so down. Yeah. Um, so where, where can we find your stuff? Um, I, I don't have anything on Apple music or Spotify, but I have like a SoundCloud where I post just random stuff occasionally. Oh, really? um, I'm probably going to eventually post some stuff on Apple Music, but I go under the alias Chalco, um, at least for right now. Okay. Yeah. How'd you come up with um, that? Um, I actually watched, um, I don't know if you know the anime series Naruto, but I watched that when I was like a kid. And they always talk about like chakras, you know, your, your chakra. And I don't know why or how I came up with Chalco <laughs> from that. But I just, it just seemed right. I don't know at the time. <laughs> nice. So let's get back to the ice real quick. So kind of a trite question to ask, but do you have short-term goals and long-term goals right now as it relates to ice? Uh, yeah. I would say like short-term goals, goals is in like next, next weekend or... Yeah, I would say that like getting into a group or having a really good 500 and trying to get into it, or a thousand, um, mostly on like fast ice here. You know, I'm used to better conditions like this. Yeah. So hopefully, being able to like possibly get into a group the next next two weekends or so, um, that's a short term short term goal for me right now. Um, Long term goals. See, it's always hard to like say what my long-term goals are because it's always just to get faster, you know. Like it's just, yeah. a, I would say, of course, hitting certain times, um, it would be cool to someday hit a 34.0 on the 500. Would be a really cool goal. Goal, I would say, in long term, as in like whole career, maybe possibly even getting the 33s one day. Well, let's um, let's hang on that for a second. It is as you get faster and faster, it's it it's quantumly harder to go from 35 to 34 than it was to go from 38 to 37. Mm -hmm. So where you are right now, um, your PB is a 34, seven, 
34.5. Oh, 34.5. Nice. So how do you get to 34? What do you have to do? What does Austin Kleba need to do better? Um, I would say, see, getting lower is always like a big one. I know that you, you hype me up and stuff like that, saying that I'm pretty low. But even like my coach, Ryan, like we're always trying to get lower. I think pushing that position um, is super important. I think there's still like a good amount of things that I need to clean up in my corner. Um, I think that I twist out um, a little bit. Like I let my pressure kind of off um, in some of my pushes. So I need to like fix those type of things. And just like very basic, I think pushing the basics is like the hardest thing. Um, yeah. And the thing that you need to do the most is like it's just it's the same things. It's just you got to go harder on them. You got to have them more exaggerated. You have to be, you know, more weight transfer, more low, more lean. Um, I think there are certain things in my skating right now that I need to fix just in general. But once it gets past a certain point, I think being able to push the basics while also not giving up other parts of your technique is what will make you faster and training like that and stuff like that so you've mastered the first part of this journey because you suffered through two years of unlearning a bunch of shit you know and having the patience to see that oh god that actually worked right so now mm -hmm. this next journey you're on to try to find just tenths of a second here and there you know i think you have the mindset now that you understand that this is not going to be easy you're not just no. going to wake up one morning and move some socks and oh there it is great i'll go 34 today yeah piece of cake yeah yeah i mean i i think you're lucky you know i think a lot of people probably go searching for stuff like that and it's 2022 so that means everybody wants instant you know gratification and it's not out there in a sport like this so it's great that you're surrounded with guys that like you said you, you use this word a bunch of times i don't know if you even noticed it but you said that that people cared and that's a that's a big one for me i mean i just i i judge a lot of my life based on just looking at people and seeing who cares like those are the people i want to be around um yeah and i think you're fortunate in that re in, in that regard right you know you've got a lot mm -hmm. of natural ability and and people are trying to surround you and and show you how hard it is to get to where you want to go but you have to go through that stuff to get there and and i think you're fortunate i think you're doing you're doing a really good job right now because the results speak for themselves right all right so before we wrap this one up i have one more question for you this one might be hard or maybe it's easy i don't know but you know can you can you tell us who austin kleba is after skating um right now i am looking to getting my computer sciences or computer science degree i was going for chemical engineering and now i think i decided that i want to do computer science more okay. um so probably doing something in that regard but post skating like that's a good question i feel like it's a hard question to think about of yeah. what i'm going to do after all this stuff it's <laughs> takes up so much time in life it's like oh man I would love to do stuff with music um, more, and like I do this all the time, so it's a lot of practice. See, I don't, I don't ever want to make it my my main business. I think I always need to have something that I'm doing on the side to actually make money and keep this as like just a hobby that I try to have fun yeah. with. I'll see if I can come up with some uh, some simple guitar stuff that I can shoot at you, and you can take it and make it awesome. So we'll have our big collab. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight. This was great. Um, our viewers won't know that we had all kinds of audio problems, but we fixed them along the <laughs> way and edited them. So I, I wish you the very best. Uh, two weeks in a row on Fast Ice up in Calgary. Um, my prediction is you will be in A group when this uh, two stretch is done. I, I can feel it. You're skating great. You look good. You got the right mindset. Chicks dig you. What else do you want? <laughs> What else could you want? What else exactly. could you want? Like? <laughs> All right, Austin, thank you for hanging out with me. This has been another fun session, and we are out of here. Thanks for having me.